times. This is going to be a history lesson. If you don't like history, you're going to be bored. But if you love history and love the Word of God, you're going to see how the Word of God prophesies everything that has happened to the Jewish people and the nation of Israel right up to the present time. So I want to begin with a word of prayer and ask God to bless our time in the study of God's Word and the history of the nation of Israel. Father God, I thank you for the joy of being a Christian. I thank you for the hope that we have through Jesus Christ. I thank you for your word and the prophetic messages which are so relevant and so up to date. And so bless the teaching, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The greatest miracle of modern history has to be the survival of the Jews and the rebirth of the nation of Israel. This happened after the Jews were scattered worldwide from their homeland for 1,878 years. When Peter the Great of Russia asked, the advisor, uh, asked his advisor to prove the existence of God, he replied, the Jews, your majesty, the Jews. What he was saying is the survival of the Jewish people is the best evidence that there is a God. Now, I'll let you see whether that is a true statement or not, but certainly... Certainly, there's a lot of evidence that would support the existence of God based upon the things that you are going to learn today. God spoke through the prophet Habakkuk. Look among the nations. Observe. Be astonished. Wonder. Because I'm doing something in your days. You would not believe if you were told. The very context of Habakkuk's message is this. The Babylonians are going to come. They're going to take the... Judah into Babylonian captivity. But the Jews ultimately are going to return to their homeland, as Jeremiah will tell us. And the Jews are going to survive while every single empire that have tried to destroy the Jewish people have bitten the dust. And that's the very reason why God says through the prophet Habakkuk, look among the nations, observe, be astonished, wonder, because I'm doing Something in your days you would not believe if you were told. Isn't it amazing that every nation and kingdom throughout history has been persecuted, captivated, and scattered? The Jews, they have fallen while the Jew still remains. And what is equally amazing, all of this was prophesied by the prophets 2,500 to, 2000, to 3,000 years ago. The survival of the Jew is not only evidence for God, but evidence that the Holy Bible is indeed the Word of God. So the first thing I want us to note in our talk is the dispersion of the Jews worldwide. In approximately 1440 B.C., Moses led the people of Israel out of Egypt, beginning a journey that would take them to the promised land of Canaan. Now, that journey was to last 11 days, according to Deuteronomy chapter 1. And they came to Mount Sinai. From Mount Sinai to the borders of the Promised Land, it was an 11-day journey. Now, they spent two years at Mount Sinai. That's where they got the law. That's where they entered into a covenant relationship with God and said, yes, we will obey your law, God. But then, from that point on, it took them 38 years to travel 11 days. That's because they were disobedient to God. That's because they did not honor the covenant that God made with them. And so as a result, Moses tells them, all the first generation that came out of Egypt, that generation is going to die. That generation under the promised land because you as a generation have complained and murmured and done the things that God did not want you to do. It's the second generation that's going to enter the promised land. So accordingly, it was about 1400 B.C. when the second generation of Hebrews were poised to cross the Jordan and enter the land that they were promised. It was then that Moses paused their journey to summarize God's law for them. Now, that's what the book of Deuteronomy is all about. The word Deuteronomy means second law. And so before the children of Israel, the second generation, enter the promised land, Moses, of course, didn't get to go. But he's saying to all of the Israelites, all the, I want to review the law. I want to make sure you understand the covenant 
that you made with God at Mount Sinai. And so he reviews the law. And then when you get to chapter 28, he talks about the conditions. And he lays down curses and he lays down blessings. If you obey the law, if you honor your covenant, you're going to be blessed. If you don't, you're going to be cursed. So Moses proclaimed, here are the blessings that they would receive if they were obedient. First of all, their enemies would be defeated, found in prosperity, and be established as a holy people whom the rest of the world would fear. On the other hand, Moses gave stern warning if they disobeyed God. They would be subject to curses. Their crops would fail. Their animals would not reproduce. They would suffer from diseases and droughts and foreign domination. This foreign domination that God would bring against them would speak a language that they would not understand. Notice Deuteronomy 28 beginning at verse 49. The Lord will bring a nation against you from afar, from the end of the earth. As swift as the eagle flies, a nation whose language you will not understand. A nation of swift countenance, which does not respect the elderly nor show favor to the young. If that were not discipline enough, and their rebellion against God continued, not only would they be subject to sickness and plagues that would leave them, notice, few in number, but the Lord will scatter you among all the peoples from one end of the earth to the other. And there you shall serve other gods, and among those nations you shall find no rest, nor shall the sole of your foot have a resting place. But there the Lord will give you a trembling heart, failing eyes, and anguish of soul. You will hang in doubt before you. You shall fear day and night and have no assurance of life. Notice what he's saying. You're going to be scattered to the very ends of the earth if you don't honor the covenant when you get a second chance. And when you're scattered, you're going to be a hated people. There's going to be anti-Semitism. Isn't that what we see in the world today? As we look back on history, everything that Moses said to the children of Israel has come true. Following the death of King Solomon, there was rivalry over who would replace Solomon on the throne. His son Rehoboam mounted the throne but raised taxes so severely he met competition in the son of one of Solomon's servants who's called a valiant warrior and his name was Jeroboam. Now you remember that in scripture. Here's, here's Rehoboam. He's now the king of Israel following his son. But he says to the people, I want to raise taxes. I really want to give it to the people. So he goes to the elderly people, and he says, I want to raise taxes. What do you think? And they said, we won't support you. If you raise taxes, we are not going to cooperate whatsoever. So he goes to the young people, and the young people say, give it to them. Raise the taxes. And that's what Rehoboam did. He followed the advice of the young people, not the wise elderly people, and it split the kingdom. And so you have the northern kingdom of Israel run by Jeroboam. He took ten of the tribes. And Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, got the southern kingdom, which became known as Judah. And that uh, two tribes there, you had Judah and the tribe of Benjamin, but the tribe of Simeon, that was uh, blended into the tribe of Judah so that they became as one tribe. But as far as the northern kingdom was concerned, Joseph was represented by his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. So what you have is two tribes called Judah. You have ten tribes in the north called Israel. You have a divided kingdom. Now the northern kingdom did not have one godly king out of a total of 19. Not one. They were all in rebellion against God throughout their history. Finally, they were carried off into captivity by the Assyrians, a people whose language they did not speak. Israel, the northern kingdom, lasted 208 years from 930 to 722 B.C. before being carried off into captivity. This fulfilled a part of Moses' words to Israel when he said, 
because of their disobedience, they would become subject to a language they did not speak. So the northern kingdom, after existing for 208 years, here comes the Assyrians and takes them into captivity, and the Jews could not understand a word they said because they did not speak their language. The southern kingdom of Judah lasted 146 years longer than did the northern kingdom. So it lasted a total of 354 years. The first prophet to speak out against Judah's increasing apostasy was Joel. He prophesied during the time of King Uzziah, when the kingdom of Judah was about 150 years old. The prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah also gave warning. In 586 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon sacked the city of Jerusalem, destroyed Solomon's temple, and carried the Jews into captivity. Their first raid into Israel was in 608 B.C. In all, the Jews served the Babylonians for 70 years. Now, Nebuchadnezzar made actually three invasions into the land. The first time he came was in the year 608. That's when he took the cream of the crop, the young people like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abed. Back. By the way, we're going to be in the book of Daniel starting in January of next year. So Daniel and his friends and the best of the young people, they're carried off into captivity first. But the real devastation came in 586 B.C. Nebuchadnezzar came, sacked the city of Jerusalem, sacked the temple, and took the rest of the Jews into captivity. That captivity lasted for 70 years. If you go from 608 to 538 B.C., what happened in 538 B.C.? That's when the Medo-Persians under King Cyrus conquered the Babylonians. And God used a pagan king to bring the Jews back to their homeland. So here is King Cyrus, and he says to the Jews, if you want to go back and rebuild the temple, if you want to go back and rebuild the city of Jerusalem, go. I'm letting you go. I'll even give you money. I'll even give you materials. I'll help you. I'll do whatever is necessary to help you get your temple and built. Well, most of the Jews remained in Babylon. And the reason for that was that's where they were born. They were never in Israel. They didn't want to go to a place that was unfamiliar to them, but on the other hand, many of the Jews did return. And yet when they did go back to their land, they were still under the control of the Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans. The reason behind the worldwide dispersion of the Jews began at the beginning of the first century. It was 6 A.D. when Israel was recognized as a Roman province. Roman rule proved harsh. The Jews were heavily taxed and culture were held in contempt. The Jewish people were outraged when the Romans took over the appointment of the high priest, resulting in the selection of Roman collaborators. Remember that King Herod the Great was ruling over the land. He was the one who tried to kill the baby Jesus. And what King Herod did was, hey, I don't like you selecting your high priest. We are going to choose who your high priest is. Well, that didn't go over very well with the Jews, as you could well imagine, plus all of the high taxation and the fact that uh, Herod the Great was an Edomite or an Edomaean. Edomaean is the Greek. Uh, Edom is the original word. that The Edomites came from Esau. So you have Esau and Isaac. Remember that problem? That's the beginning of the real problems in the Middle East, the fight between Isaac and Esau. Isaac became the head of the Jews. Esau became the head of the Arab people. So you have here a king ruling over Israel who was an Edomite or an Edomian, if you're using the Greek term. So ultimately, the treatment of the Romans led to a Jewish revolt in 66 AD. The revolt led to a siege of Jerusalem by Roman troops in 70 AD. Tens of thousands of Jews were slaughtered while thousands of scattered to other countries and the worldwide dispersion began. But this tragedy failed to quell the rebellious spirit of the Jews. Fifty-two years later, they rose up in rebellion once again in a well-organized guerrilla campaign that lasted three years, from 132 to 135 A.D. This revolt proved to be the last straw for the Romans. Hadrian... The Roman emperor responded brutally. According to Roman historian Cassius Dio, 
who died in 235 A.D. 580,000 Jews were killed and 50 fortified towns and 985 villages were razed to the ground. Many who were not killed were sold into slavery. The ultimate result of the destruction of Judah was the worldwide dispersion of the remaining Jewish people. There were small pockets of Jewish people who still remained in their homeland, settling mainly in the region of Galilee and the city of Tiberias, which is located right next to the Sea of Galilee. But the vast majority of the Jews were scattered worldwide. This again fulfilled what Moses had warned the children of Israel, that when given a second chance to honor the covenant they initially made with God, if they refuse to do so, the Lord will scatter you among all from one end of the earth to the other. It was the first century Jewish historian Josephus who wrote, There is no city, no tribe, whether Greek or barbarian, in which Jewish law and Jewish customs have not taken root. Now, I just want to back up a moment. I want you to get a clear understanding of what we've just talked about. This is what Moses said to the children of Israel. I am reviewing the law with you. I am telling you, you had better honor the, com uh, the covenant that you made with God. If you do, you're going to be blessed. If you don't, you're going to be cursed. And the first thing he then says is, you're going to be carried to a nation of people who speak a language that you do not know. And so they were. The northern kingdom Israel was taken into Assyrian captivity. The southern kingdom of Judah was taken into Babylonian captivity. Now the Jews in the Assyrian captivity, when the Babylonians conquered the Assyrians, those Jews now became part of the Babylonian captivity. Then they're going to return to their homeland. Then Moses says this, if a second time, if a second time, and we'll get to this in the book of Isaiah in just a moment. If a second time you do not honor the covenant of God, you're going to be one end of the earth to the other. And that is exactly what has happened. While the scattering of the Jews at the end of the Middle Ages, around 14 AD, the Jews had formed into four identifiable groups. There was the Ashkenazi Jews of Central and Eastern Europe. There was the Sephardic Jews of Portugal and Spain. There was the Mizraite Jews of Persia and the Ottoman Empire who was subject to Muslim rule. And there was the Antium Jews who were forced to convert to Christianity or Islam. Each of these groups were isolated from each other and each had their own distinct form of dress and language. That's important to understand. Once the Jews were scattered from one end of the earth to the other, they lost their language. They lost their worship. They lost their customs. So that one group of Jews could not even communicate with another group of Jews if they were to get together. In 1492, when the Jews were expelled from Spain, some migrated to North Africa and throughout the Ottoman Empire and even to Latin America. Some traveled with Christopher Columbus on the voyage across the Atlantic Ocean by the 11th century. Jewish migration shifted to Spain and France and Germany and Poland. During the 19th century, the Jews began to migrate in sufficient numbers to the Western Hemisphere, North and South Africa, America, rather, North and South America. According to Roman records, there were Eight to ten million Jews at the end of the first century. During the same period, according to Roman records, China had grown from 30 million to over one billion people. Now, notice this. Based on growth statistics like this, in other words, if the Jewish population had grown at the same rate over the first century as the Chinese population had grown, there should be in the world today 500 million Jews. Instead, there are only 14 million, with 6 million residing in the reestablished state of Israel. Moses had warned the people, and the Lord will scatter you among the peoples, and you shall be left few in number. Get that. You shall be left few in number among the nations where the Lord shall drive you. 
You can see everything that Moses said to the children of Israel before they entered the promise came true. And some of this in our lifetime. Notice the decision now by Zionists to return to their homeland. You're going to find this fascinating. Fascinating. Notice the prophesying of the Jewish regathering. The prophet Jeremiah said the days are coming when the Lord who brought them out of Egypt will deliver them from all the lands that he has delivered them and bring them back to the land which he gave to their forefathers. The prophet Isaiah said, It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left and gather the dispersed from the four corners of the earth. Notice Isaiah speaks about the second time. Very important. I would underline the Bible or underline it in your notes. The second time. What's the first time? That's when the Jews came back from Babylonian captivity. What's the second time? That's when the Jews came back to Israel, or Palestine as it was known then, after a worldwide dispersion. In Isaiah chapter 43, verse 6, the prophet says this, He mentions two designated locations from where the Jews will migrate back to the land, from the north and from the south. So there's going to be this invasion of Jews back into the land of Palestine. They're coming as immigrants to their land from the north and from the two primary areas. So notice from the north, when communism fell in in 1989, anti-Semitism grew in Russia. And the Jews were blamed for the collapse. So when when communism fell, who gets the blame? The Jews. And so the Jews are being persecuted in Russia, and they say, we got to get out of here. And so they begin to migrate back to the land of Palestine, as it was known then. In the early 90s, they were arriving at a rate of 10,000 per month. Now notice from the south. The second largest immigration of black Jews came from Ethiopia in what is known as the Operaman. Black Jews. How did Jews become black? We don't know for sure. But there's an interesting story in 2 Chronicles in your Old Testament. It says this. Remember the Queen of Sheba? She was a black woman from Ethiopia. And she heard about the wisdom of Solomon. And so she decides, I want to visit this man. I want some of his wisdom. Now, you know something about Solomon. He liked women. And I imagine that he and the Queen of Sheba went to bed together. And she got pregnant. And when she went to Ethiopia, she bears a son. And that son is black. And thus... You have black Jews now beginning in Ethiopia. You'll remember uh, in Acts chapter 8, you have the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. Here's here's the uh, treasurer of Queen Candice of, uh, of Ethiopia, and he's gone to Jerusalem. Why? Because he wants to celebrate the Jewish feasts. And so he's in his chariot, he's going back home, and he's reading from the book of Isaiah. Well, here's Philip. He's an evangelist. He's been preaching to the people in Samaria. And the Lord says to Philip, I want you to go and this Ethiopian eunuch. He's reading the Bible and he doesn't understand what he's reading. And so Philip comes and joins him on the chariot. And and he says, "Uh, do you understand what you're... No, I don't. And Philip taught him from the book of Isaiah that Jesus was the Messiah. And the Ethiopian eunuch gave his life to Christ, got baptized, and he goes back to Ethiopia, a believer in Jesus the Messiah. Now, in the late 1950s, this is an incredible story. In the late 1950s, the Jews of Ethiopia began to feel the tug on their hearts to return to the Jewish homeland. In response, they started reading to Addis Ababa by the thousands, where they camped near the international airport demanding transportation to Israel. So this Addis Abada is a city in uh, Ethiopia. They have this international airport there. Thousands of Jews 
arrive at this airport and say, we want to go back to Israel. The government refused to let them leave. In demanding, uh, in, uh, in uh, fulfillment of prophecy, rather, so, so the government says, no, you can't go. So in fulfillment of prophecy, notice Isaiah 43, verse 6, it says this, that the Jews in the south were held back. How did Isaiah know that? That when these black Jews from the south get to the airport, the government is going to say, you can't go. And they're held back. But in 1991, as Ethiopian government began to crumble in the midst of a civil war, the United States and Israel intervened providing bribes to military leaders. The government then rented and provided a 48-hour window of time for the refugees to depart. The resulting airlift in May 1991 was amazing in just 36 hours. 14,000 Ethus, nearly the entire Jewish population, was flown to Tel Aviv in 40 flights involving 35 aircraft. At one point, there were 28 planes in the air at the same time, and the world record was set when one El Al Boeing 747, designed to carry 350 people, was loaded with 1,086 passengers. There they are. This was possible because all the seats had been stripped out of the plane and none were allowed to carry any luggage, only the clothes on their backs. When they reached Tel Aviv, there was a total of 1,088 as two babies had been born en route. They started out with 1,086. They ended up with 1,088. Now listen to what the prophet Jeremiah says. Jeremiah 31, verse 8, Behold, I'm bringing them from the north country, and I will gather them from the remote parts of the earth, among them the blind and the lame, the woman with child, and she who is in labor with child, together a great company, they will return here. What an amazing fulfillment of prophecy. That when these black Jews are coming back to Israel, because they say, this is our homeland. Jeremiah says, hey, there's going to be two mothers on that plane that are going to give birth to children. So we see prophesying of the Jewish regathering. Notice next. The person who inspired the regathering, his name was Theodor Herzl, died in 1904. He was a Hungarian Jewish journalist who lived in Vienna, Austria, is recognized as the father of Zionism. Zionism refers to the national liberation and the return of the Jewish people to lay claim to the land of Palestine as it was known prior to Israel becoming a nation in 1948. Herzl's inspiration to find a homeland for the Jews came when he went to Paris to cover the Dreyfus Affair. Alfred Dreyfus, a Jewish French army officer, was accused of passing secret French military documents to the German embassy in Paris. Though he was innocent, he was condemned to life in prison. Later he was declared innocent and set free. But Herzl witnessed the anti-Semitic demonstrations against Dreyfus and concluded were subject to slander in a country as enlightened as France. Jews would not be safe anywhere among the nations of the Gentiles. The Jews needed their own homeland as protection against anti-Semitism. So Herzl saw Palestine as the most logical location. He founded the World Zionist Organization with the goal of establishing a home for the Jewish people in Palestine. Because of operation, because of this, uh, uh, because of opposition, Herzl considered Argentina and Uganda as potential homelands for the Jews until international recognition by given to Palestine. So it's kind of interesting. He, got, he, he wants to go back to Palestine. That, of course, originally was Israel. 
became Palestine around 135 A.D. under Adrian of, uh, of Rome. That's where it got its name. And it refers, by the way, to the Philistines, who were the biggest enemy of Israel. Zionists believed that once in their land they would win worldwide acceptance and not receive such hatred from Gentile nations. If we just had our own country, hey, everybody in the world will leave us alone. Between 1900 and 1914, about 40,000 new Jewish immigrants moved to Palestine. At the time, Palestine was under the Muslim Ottoman Empire and sparsely occupied by Arabs, though the Jews have always lived in the land, but few of them. The few Arabs who lived there were not happy with Jewish immigration because they believed it would lead to their replacement from the land. So notice next now, the purchasing of land from Arab landowners. This is important to understand because I'll tell you what's being taught in our universities today. I've talked with liberals about this. And one reason why they hate the Jews is because when the Jews went to get their land, they got an army together and fought the Arabs in the land and took the land away from the Arabs. That is fake news. That is not true at all. I'm going to set the record straight. To help solve the problem between Jews and Arabs in the early 1900s with the help of the Rothschild Foundation and Jewish National Funds, it was agreed to purchase the land for exorbitant prices which Arab landowners were willing to accept. They continued to buy land through the British Mandate period, which I'll talk about in just a bit. The land seemed worthless, as Mark Twain, who visited Palestine in 1867, describes a desolate country whose soil is rich enough but is given over wholly to weeds. A desolation is here that not even imagination can grace with the pomp of life and action. Do we have a picture of the land, uh, the desolate land that he's talking about here? There's hardly a tree or shrub anywhere. Even the olive and the cactus, those fast friends of the worthless soil, had almost deserted the country. When the Turks entered World War I in 1915, they went on the side of Germany, and when the Germans lost the war, the Ottoman Empire collapsed. It was England that was given control of Palestine while the French got control of Lebanon, Syria, and part of Iraq. At first, England agreed to give all of Palestine, which included modern-day Jordan, to the Jews, as their future home. This was all confirmed on November the 2nd, 1917 in a document known as the Balfour Declaration. Immediately, the Arabs objected. And in 1922, the British decided not to follow the Balfour Declaration and gave two-thirds of Palestine to the Arabs establishing the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. There you find all of Palestine. Initially, all of that land in the yellow was to be given to the nation of Jordan. So if you, if you took Jewish Palestine and, and the land of uh, what is now Transjordan, all of that was, was Palestine, and that was the land that was given to the Jews So on both sides of the Jordan River. All of that was given to the Jews in the Balfour Declaration. So you can see how much territory they had. So the British uh, chose, however, not to give them all the land after making the agreement with this Balfour Declaration. And the reason for that was the uh, Hashemite clan in Arabia supported the British against the Turkish Ottomans. This left Palestine west of the Jordan River to be divided between Jews and Arabs who were already living in the land. So now the League of Nations entrusted the divided Palestine to the British as a mandate. So the League of Nations says to Great Britain, you now have this, all this land. I want you to divide it, some going to uh, the Jews, some going to the Arabs. So the British soon found themselves in a bloody Jewish-Arab struggle for land because you now have Jews, you have Arabs in the same land. What's happening? They're fighting one another. And Winston Churchill says, I've had enough. And so he urged an end to the mandate, mandate at the feet of the United Nations. 
So, Winston Churchill now is withdrawing all of his soldiers from the Middle East. He says, I'm not going to lose any of my men because Jews and Arabs can't get along. Sound familiar? In 1947, the UN General Assembly approved Resolution 181 calling for a Jewish state and a Palestinian state west of the Jordan. The Palestinians would get 42% of the land and the Jews would get 56%, which included the inhospitable Negev Desert. Jerusalem and Bethlehem would be under UN control. Palestine would get the West Bank and Gaza. The Arab state would embrace 4,500 square miles with 840,000 Arabs and 10,000 Jews. The Jewish state would encompass 5,500 square miles with 538,000 Jews and 397,000 Arabs. Jerusalem and Bethlehem, those two holy cities, were internationalized. In other words, they didn't belong to the Jews, they didn't belong to the Arabs, they're going to be internationalized, they're going to belong to the United Nations. They had a combined population of 200,000, which was equally divided between Jews and Arabs. Before Israel officially became a nation in 1948, consider how the land agreement for a Jewish state had been shrunk by Great Britain and the United Nations. In 1917, under the Balfour Declaration, they had all of Palestine. In 1922, under the League of Nations, they had one-fourth of the land. In 1947, under the United Nations, they had less than one-eighth of the land. And they were surrounded by 22 Arab nations who didn't want them to have any of the land. The combined Arab nations had a land ratio of 662 to 1 and a population advantage of 53 to 1. So understand the situation that Israel is in, even today. For every one acre that the Jewish people have, the Arabs have 662 acres. And for every single Jew, there is 53 Arabs. So there are these 22 nations that surround the nation of Israel today, and all of them hate the Jew. All of them want to drive the Jew out of the land. Now let's talk about the declaration of the sovereign nation of Israel. Israel accepted and claimed their share of the land under the UN Resolution 181. This Grand General Assembly of 1947. So they said, okay, we will accept we will accept what they're telling us. Well, the Arabs rejected the resolution wanting more of the land based on population imbalance. There were 68% more Arabs than Jews. However, on May the 14th, 1948, Israeli Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion declared the existence of the independent state of Israel. Israel became a nation in one day fulfilling a prophecy from Isaiah where he said, Israel will become a nation in one day. That day, May 14th, 1948. Immediately. Now get this. Immediately. One day old. Israel was attacked by five Arab nations. Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Iraq, and Egypt. This was Israel's war of independence, but to the Arabs it was called the war of catastrophe. Five nations could not defeat a nation one day old. Do you think God had something to do with that? In the uh, 1949 armistice agreement, the wet now, as a result now of Israel conquering these nations, they, they got to rework this whole land thing. So, in 1949 armistice agreement, the West Bank was given to Jordan and the Gaza Strip to Egypt. So now you have the nation of Jordan, which was on the uh, east side of the Jordan River, and you have the Gaza Strip. That's that little piece of land along the Mediterranean. So, as a result of this war of independence, Israel gains more territory. In fact, even some of the territory north of the uh, West Bank, uh, all the way up to Lebanon, now comes into Israel's uh, territory. So the size of the West Bank shrunk, and modern Jerusalem, not old Jerusalem, 
But modern Jerusalem came under Israeli control. Remember at first, the says, no, this is going to be an internationalized city. But as a result of this war of independence, when Israel in one day defeats five nations that attack it, Jerusalem now comes under Israeli control, but not, not East Jerusalem, not the old Jerusalem, not the holy Jerusalem, not the walled Jerusalem, but modern Jerusalem. On October 1956, there was the Sinai Peninsula War with Egypt when President Nasser seized control of the Suez Canal and nationalized it, cutting off oil supplies not only to Israel but also to Europe. And with Britain and France, Israel invaded the Sinai, regained control of the Sinai Canal, opening up the transporting of oil to Israel and Europe. Then you have the 1967 Six-Day War, when Syria, Egypt, Jordan, mobilized troops along the borders ready to attack Israel. Israel launched a preemptive strike driving the Syrians back to Damascus, the Jordanians back to Amman, the Egyptians back to Cairo, all in six days between June the 5th and June the 10th. In doing so, this is important, in doing so they gained control of the Golan Heights. The Golan Heights is that northern part that was owned by Syria. And they gained control of uh, the West Bank. That was under the control of Jordan, which also included East Jerusalem. So in the Six-Day War, the six day, this is when the city of Jerusalem is united and under Jewish control. Remember what Jesus said in Luke chapter 21? When the city of Jerusalem is no longer under Gentile control. Look up. Your redemption draws nigh. We're living in that time. Jesus prophesied the time when all of Jerusalem would no longer be under Gentile control. And then you have uh, the 1973 uh, Yom Kippur War. While Israel was celebrating their holiest day, Egypt and Syria led a surprise attack against Israel. They wiped out the entire Israeli Air Force. I think they only had one plane left, a little propeller plane. Prime Minister Golda Meir appealed to the United States for arms and to the Shah of Iran who occupied, uh, who supplied Israel with warplanes. Now, when, when Carter was president of the United States, I mean, he made a blunder. Because Jimmy Carter did not like the Shah of Iran. He wanted him out. And yet the Shah of Iran was a friend of the United States and a friend of Israel. He supplied airplanes to help the nation of Israel conquer the enemy that attacked them in the Yom Kippur War. Why didn't he want Shah? Well, one reason is he was not religious enough. You see, the Shah was a Muslim, but he was not a practicing Muslim. And uh, Jimmy Carter had the idea, if we got Muslim in there, a practicing Muslim, this would be better for the Middle East. So the Khomeini steps in, who's a practicing Muslim, because Jimmy Carter believed that Allah and Jehovah were the same God. Stupid! And there is the problem we have in the Middle East. <laughs> I won't repeat that. Okay. Well, there's some other wars that have taken place. I'm not going to get into them. You know that just this last week, uh, Israel had to shell uh, uh, the Gaza Strip again. Uh, from the Gaza Strip, they're sending missiles over. But I'm going to talk furthermore about the city of Jerusalem. It has become the center of political contention worldwide. The prophet Zechariah said, In the last days Jerusalem will become a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples and a very heavy stone for all peoples, all who would heave it away. The city of Jerusalem. That city is mentioned more in the news than any other city. 
I remember when I was very young in the ministry. I mean, I, I just start now. And I had a wise man. I don't remember what, he, what his name was. He came up to me and he says, uh, Pastor Ron, I mean, I'm in my 20s. He said, Pastor Ron, I want you to keep your eye on the news about the city of Jerusalem. You just find a little paragraph about Jerusalem in the news today. But the time is going to come when Jerusalem is going to be headlines in the news. It was that statement that really piqued my curiosity about the Middle East. Why would he say something like that? He was right. When Barack Obama was our president, his peace plan in the Middle East supported a UN resolution that said Israel had no right to the city of Jerusalem as it lies in Palestinian territory. By Jonathan Kahn, whom I believe to be the most influential pastor in the United States today, believes that God's punishment on Barack Obama and fellow Democrats who oppose Israel was the election of Donald Trump, who since has declared Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and moved our U.S. Embassy there. I might get fired for saying that, but you support me, will you? <laughs> He also recognized the Golan Heights as Israel's territory. God has said, those who bless be blessed and those who curse Israel will be cursed. Folks, we have to elect a president that supports the nation of Israel or we as a nation are doomed. Amen. Yes, the promise of God is once Israel is back in her land, she will never be uprooted. God spoke through the prophet Amos. I will plant them on their land and they shall never again be uprooted out of the land that I have given them, says the Lord your God. Israel is back in her land. She is a nation again and the whole world can come against Israel. Let me tell you, will not drive Israel out of her land. God has stated so. Well, we got to uh, keep moving here. The discovering of God's blessings on the new nation of Israel. When the Jews first began to regather in their land, it was a malaria-infested wilderness. Moses had prophesied that when they would be scattered to the nations, they would not uh, they would only become a uh, they would not only become a persecuted people, where there would be no resting place for the sole of their feet. He says, but their land would become desolate and their cities would become waste. So, here's something interesting. Every time the Jews are in, the land is prosperous. The land is overflowing with milk and honey. As soon as the Jews are driven out of their land, what you have is a barren land. It becomes nothing but wilderness. Moses put it more graphically when he said this. The foreigner who comes from a distant land will say, all its land is brimstone and salt, a burning waste, unsown and unproductive, and no grass grows on it. God also promised to preserve the Jews, even in the midst of persecution, with their persecution culminating in the Nazi Holocaust of World War II, where six million Jews were gassed to death. In the lifetime of many of us, we have witnessed several about Israel, which is evidence of God's faithfulness to His people and His promises. Let me just give you a few of them. Number one, the regathering of the people. The Old Testament prophets promised repeatedly that the day would come when God would regather the Jews from the four corners of the earth and bring them back to their land. It has happened. The reestablishment of the state of Israel. Once the people started to return to their homeland, they would become a nation again in a single day. This occurred on May the 14th. 1948, this has happened, the reclamation of the land. God promised that with the reestablishment of the nation, the land would bloom like a rock. Ezekiel put it like this, the day will come when people will exclaim, this desolate land has become like the Garden of Eden. Today Israel is a land overflowing with milk and honey. Over 300 million trees were planted in the 20th century. Rainfall during that time has increased 450 percent. Former malaria infested swamps have been converted into cultivated land. You know what the Jews have been able to do today? Amazing. 
they can take rainwater and uh, turn it into uh, drinking water. They, 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 uh, they, they can take, oh, this is what, this is, they can take urine and purify urine. So if you go to Israel, drinking somebody's urine, but it's pure. Notice the resourcefulness of oil for the uh, enrichment of Israel. Former Prime Minister Golda Meir often joked, God guided the Jewish people through the desert to, own, to the only land in the Middle East without oil. John Brown, a born-again Christian and an oil man from Texas, was reading the book of Deuteronomy. He came across Jacob giving his final blessings to his 12 sons. Now here's the blessing. And of Asher, he said, Here is most blessed of sons. Let him be favored by his brothers, and let him dip his foot in oil. Whoa. Your sandals shall be iron and bronze, meaning that Israel is going to become very wealthy once they discover oil. And your days shall strength be. Brown was determined to find that oil. One verse uh, in, the, in Scripture helped him a little further. And it was part of the song of Moses. And it's found in Deuteronomy chapter 32. So the Lord alone led him, and there was no foreign God with him. He made him ride on the heights of the earth, that he might eat the produce. He, might, he, he made him draw honey from the rock and oil from the flinty rock. So in Deuteronomy 32, Brown says, look, here's a couple more clues. This oil is going to be in the heights of the earth, and it's going to come from the flinty rock. After many attempts, oil was found, but not enough to make Israel independent of oil and gas. Then in 1991, Gideon Tadmor, a young Israeli lawyer, based on what little oil Brown discovered, believed there was oil off the coast of Israel in the Mediterranean Sea. The tribe of Asher was the northernmost tribe low Mediterranean coast. Off the coast of Asher, Tadmor struck oil. Today, Israel is oil rich. Their offshore drilling is making Israel the Middle East's new exporter of oil. In other words, oil coming from Israel is now being shipped down to Egypt. It's being shipped throughout Europe. They have so much oil, they don't know what to do with it. And you know where they got the idea? It came from the Bible. Isn't this an amazing book we study? Notice the Hebrew language. When the Jews were scattered in the first century, they ceased speaking Hebrew. Remember we told you about these four groups of Jews as they're scattered. They don't worship the same. They don't dress the same. They don't speak the same. They all lost their native language. So, we see where uh, uh, in, in, the, in the book of uh, Zephaniah, it implies a time would come when the Hebrew language would be revived. And so a man by the name of Eliezer ben Yehuda revived the ancient Hebrew, which today is the official language of Israel. Notice the reoccupation of Jerusalem. Jesus said one of the sure of his imminent return would be the reoccupation of Jerusalem by the Jews when the Gentiles would no longer occupy the city. It would all come under Jewish control. Jerusalem became a united city for the first time in 1,837 years when Israel captured East Jerusalem in the Six-Day War, June 1967. Now, I'm going, to, I'm going to say something I never thought I'd ever say. But it just came to me this week, and I'm studying this. Here's what Jesus said. He said, remember the parable of the fig tree? He said, this generation will not pass away. The son of man comes. The question is, how long is a generation, and what generation is he talking about? Well, in the context, he's talking about the generation when the city of Jerusalem is totally under Jewish control, okay? How long is a generation? The, 
the, the book of uh, the psalmist tells us a generation is 70 to 80 years. So, in 1947, that's when Israel came under, uh, that's when the city of Jerusalem came under control uh, uh, the, of the Jews. Start in 1947. Add 70 years to that, that takes you to 2017. In 2017, what did Israel celebrate? Their 70th anniversary. 2017 begins the definition of a generation. If a generation is 70 to 80 years, could it be possible that we have at best 10 years left before the Lord comes back? I'm not setting a date. I'm not setting a year. I'm just looking at the text. Folks, we're living in the last days. And when you consider what's happening in when Turkey and Russia and Iran are all in Turkey and they are the nations that are going to come against Israel in the Ezekiel 38, 39 war. And did you know that the Russians alone are on the Syrian border right next to Israel today? Folks, it's getting close. It's getting close. We need prophetic preaching today. We need to wake people up. Now, don't walk out of here and say, hey, Keller's a date set. <laughs> All you need to do is say, hey, the year started in the year 2017. We're coming close to 2020. Okay? So, 2000 what? 27? And if, you, and if you recognize that the rapture of the church occurs seven years before the tribulation... Subtract seven years. I'm ready to go, Lord. Get me out of here. We're getting close. Notice now the uh, resurgence of the military. The prophet Zechariah spoke the military strength of Israel would be overwhelming like a flaming torch among the sheaves. And they... Uh, and that they would consume, notice, they would consume all the peoples around them. What have they been doing? Today, this tiny nation has the eighth strongest military in the world. Notice next the refocusing of uh, world politics. Israel is always pictured as the focal point of world politics in the end times. The struggle over land settlements by Israel is so-called occupied territories as well as the subjects of wars and worldwide scorn and numerous peace treaties. I want to back up just a second because I gave you the wrong dates. Israel became a nation not in 1947, in 1948. It was in 2018 when uh, Israel celebrated their 70th anniversary. So... Uh, I'm off one year. I don't know why I went, <laughs> you know, just got excited. Okay. Let me just close with this. In, 19, in 1899, Mark Twain wrote of the Jew, If the statistics are correct, the Jews represent mainly 1% of humanity, an irrelevant spark in the light of the Milky Way. Normally speaking, the Jew they heard of, and yet, we hear of them again and again. They can rival any people on earth for fame, and their significance in economy and trade are in no relation to their population. Their contribution to the list of great names in literature, natural science, art, finance, medicine, and profound learning is just as amazing. They have done extremely good in the world, and their hands have been tied behind their backs. Sounds like something like Limbaugh would say. They should rightly be proud of themselves. The Egyptians, Babylonians, and Persians came to power, filled the earth with their glory, but perished. The Greeks and the Romans followed, made a lot of noise, and then dissipations arose. Their torches burned for a while, and then they extinguished, and today sit in the twilight or are completely disappeared. Jews saw it all. They beat them all. And today, 
are what they always were, showing no decay, no aging, no weakening, no decline of energy, no blunting of their world, of their wide awake dynamic spirit. Everything is normal except the Jew. All other powers perish, but he remains. And then Mark Twain closes with this question. What is the mystery of his immortality? Only he would have read the word of God. Because God said the Jews are going to continue until the very end. And once they're back in their land again, they will never be removed. Yes, it was the assistant of Peter the Great who told Peter the Great that the real evidence for God is the Jew. It's the Jew, your majesty. It's the Jew. Well, this was a big lesson today, a real history lesson, but I hope you found it something that was interesting. Okay, I'm four minutes uh, late. If you need to leave.